Hello, everyone. Jerry Shockey here with the Pro Football of Fame. I'm the Director of Youth and Education here, and I want to welcome you guys to this uh, video that we're doing here. Uh, what we're doing is, is taking some of our most popular uh, programs that we offer through our youth educational programs as, as field trips or video conferences, and uh, taking them and condense them down to like a 15 or 20 minute video uh, that uh, you can take on demand at any time. So uh, it'll be available on our, on our YouTube channel, our Youth Education YouTube channel, uh, and basically boiling down our 50 or 60 minute program down to a 15 to 20 minute video that uh, as teachers, you can use in your classroom, we send it home as an assignment for kids, or, or you can if days off or snow days or anything like that, you can use it for those. Uh, or parents, you've stumbled upon this, is that you can utilize it at home using the game of football to teach it different things. And so whether it's math, science, social studies, whatever it might be. But today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the story of pro football. And we're going to do this in a very quick fashion. Again, we're going to take a 50 or 60 minute program and boil it down to uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but before we do that, uh, one thing I'll always like, we always like to do is, is go ahead and I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, let me go ahead and you'll see here, you'll see a map. And that map is where we are at, obviously. And so, so whether you're connecting it from anywhere across the country or you're watching this from uh, other parts of the world, uh, the Pro Football of Fame is in Canton, Ohio, and I'll zoom in on our building so you can see that. <clears throat> and then you can see not only our building here, but then next door to us is actually uh, Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium. That's where the annual Hall of Fame game is played this year. Is going to be, which is announced not too long ago, uh, last week that we're going to be uh, the the, the um, Dallas Cowboys will be playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. As we're inducting new members of the Pro Football of Fame this year, Troy Polamalu, Bill Cowher, Jimmy Johnson, a bunch of other guys uh, that will be here, and then our concert for legends that'll take place that here in uh, the first full week in, in, in August. And so. Um, but one thing we like to do is uh, just share a little bit about who we are. Now, typically we go through a video and go into more in depth about who we are and what it is we do. And we show this Game for Life video that I just skipped past. But I just want to read to you guys real quick. Uh, our mission here at the Pro Football Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, preserve its history, promote its values, and to celebrate excellence everywhere. Our vision, it's not just about the past, it's the future. It's not just about Canada, it's the world. It's not just a great museum for football. It's a message of excellence everywhere. Our values are commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and, and excellence. And so uh, I'm going to stop share here because we're going to lock on to me here for a little while here today as we talk about the story of pro football. And, and one of the things you, uh, you know, always ask is, you know, what do kids think of when you think of a museum? And I'll let you guys take a second just to think about that. What's the first word or the first image that comes to your mind when you think of a museum? And probably the first thought that came to your mind might have been dinosaur bones, maybe a Picasso painting or paintings, uh, maybe presidents, maybe mummies, maybe automobiles, uh, maybe natural history. I mean, all kinds of, there's all kinds of different museums. But typically, most people, when they think of a museum, do not think of Football, when they think of a museum, they think of all these other things. For me personally, first thing I think of is dinosaur bones, or as I watch with my two boys, eight and 11 year olds, uh, the, the third and sixth graders, is we watch Night at the Museum. And I think all three of them are awesome. Uh, so those are the things that I think of, you know, big T Rex chasing Penn still around the museum, uh, something like that. But most people do not think of football when they think of a museum. But the Pro Football of Fame at our most basic, at the core of who we are, and we're so many other things, uh, a lot of things that we're doing all across the country, and a village that we're building here but at the core of who we are at the Pro Football of Fame is we are a museum and museums do two basic things now one of those words you guys be very familiar with and that's educate we hope to teach that's what we're doing here today that's what with all these five or six videos that we're going to be sending out uh they're going to be put on our YouTube channel and aim to educate you guys about a certain area uh whether it's in, in, with pro football history as well as with a particular curricular area um, but the other thing that museums do in addition to educate is that they preserve history and we're no different than any other museum. And so we preserve through a wide variety of ways. When you think about the environment of the building, the uh, temperature has to be controlled. Typically temperature has to be somewhere between 65 and 68 degrees. That's supposed to be the optimal temperature for preservation. Uh, humidity has to be controlled. Humidity should be at about 50%. Uh, if you get too much humidity, you get moisture, you get mold, you get things like that. You get too low of humidity, things start drying out, especially paper products, leather cracks, things like that. So those things are not good as well. So humidity should be right about the middle, about 50%. Uh, lighting is very important. Obviously, 
Um, the best thing for any artifact is not to see any light whatsoever. But if we do have to put light on it, are, what kind of lighting are we using? Are we giving out, are we using the lighting that, that uh, gives off heat or ultraviolet rays or infrared rays? These things that can be damaging not only to our skin, but damaging to our artifacts. And so there's special lights that we use and filters and things like that uh, to, to control those things. So those are all things we have to think of. Because the best thing, again, for any artifact is not to see any lights whatsoever. But then if we did that, we obviously would not have a Hall of Fame for people to come visit. And so we want to put things on display. So one of the interesting things we have to do as a museum is try to tell the history of the game, but also try to tell it in an in a, in a interesting fashion so people come back. And so those are kind of the two basic criteria. Certainly there's a lot of other criteria that we would go by if there's a certain themed exhibit that we're doing or something like that. Certainly those things are in play. But overall, as a museum, you want to put things on display that help tell the history of the best but it's also gonna be something that's gonna be interesting to fans because we want people to come back. We want people to continually come see us here at the Pro Football of Fame. And so I wanna tell you one of those stories. And what's really neat about our collection at the Pro Football of Fame is in our three-dimensional collection and what we refer to as our, our, our artifacts, these football jerseys, uh, helmets, shoulder pads, you know, all these different things. We have about 40,000 artifacts in our collection. Okay, in our historical documents, which is our paper products, uh, newspaper clippings, game programs, media guides, photos, we have about 40 million pages of documents. So we have so much, uh, so much information that we have at our fingertips and we can't, uh, obviously can't put it all on display. So we have to choose those things that we think work best uh, to tell the history of the best. And so one of those stories that we talk about at the Hall of Fame, and we talk about it through our video conferencing programs, you'll notice I'm putting on gloves. When we talk about preservation. One of the other things we can talk about with preservation is the oils and things on our fingers. And so the, all those oils can be very damaging to our artifacts. And so one of the things that we talk about is one of the stories we tell is a story about this. And so some of you are probably looking at that wondering, what in the world is this? So I'll give you a chance to guess what it might be. And so I'll kind of move it around, give you a chance to look at it. Some kids think it looks like a dolphin. Uh, some people think it's a cup. <laughs> it is not. It's actually to protect something on your face. See if you guys get it. You're right, it's a, it's a nose guard. It's a nose guard. And this, on the inside, it says patented 1891. So it came about all the way back in 1891. And what players did, and this didn't last very long, what the players did was they put this part of their mouth and they had straps that went around their heads and they wore it like this. And trust me, if this is a 130-year-old cup, I would not be doing this right now. Uh, but they bit down on it and their straps went around the head. Some of them had ear pads and things that went, went around the ears as well, some different variations. But it didn't help at all. It actually made things worse. You can imagine that it's better just to be smacked in the face like this than it would be to have this and get smacked in the face. And so it didn't last very long. Players still broke their noses, knocked out teeth, things like that it was supposed to be protecting them from. Now, if we move into the early 1910s, 1920s, a lot of different variations. Again, this is made out of leather. All right. Uh, this one was made out of a hard rubber. This is made out of leather now. You see the wool uh, holes on top for them. That's right. It's for ventilation, for air. So even at that time, they're thinking of the head breathing, not overheating and things like that. There are a lot of different variations of the leather helmet, but this would have been one that would have been worn back in the 1910s, 1920s. And so you can see pretty flimsy, a little bit of wool on the inside. Uh, better than hitting bare head to bare head, but obviously not much better. So as, as we progress the helmet into the 40s, we have seen this also made out of leather, just has a hard shell on the inside, uh, leather uh, on the outside, you can see. And so uh, if you can imagine, so what is missing from this helmet that's on today's helmets? See if you guys can guess that. You can go ahead and say it for a second. And probably some of you said the face mask, uh, obviously. And so there were attempts to put face masks on a helmet like this, but one good tug, that face mask would rip uh, right off. A uh, chin strap, there was actually a chin strap on this helmet, uh, but it just is no longer on there. So a chin strap it is, and this particular helmet is missing. But what is on the side of today's helmets that's, that's on today? See if you guys can guess that. And you'd be right, it's, it's a, the team logo, uh, the team decal, team logo. Now, does anybody know what NFL team actually had the very first logo? It's a team that plays today, it's a team that played all the way back in the 40s and 50s. See if you can guess that. And I'll give you a hint, it's an animal nickname. See if that narrows it down. You think about a couple teams for a second. Now I'll give you a bigger hint. It's a horned animal nickname. 
And that's right. It's, it's the Rams. It's the Los Angeles Rams. And so uh, a player um, uh, on the team for the Rams, a guy named Fred Gerke, who's a halfback, who's not only a talented artist but uh, and a gifted runner, but he was a talented artist as well. He actually hand-painted, if you can imagine this in those days, uh, he actually hand-painted each one of his teammates' helmets with that spiral ram horn that you see on today's helmets. And within the next 10 years, just about every team in the NFL actually picked up with the trend of getting uh, logos on their helmets. And so, uh, and so it was the only, there's only one team today that doesn't have a logo on their helmet. See if you guys can guess that. The Cleveland Browns, that's right. And then the, the other uh, team, the other, you know, there's only one team that only has a logo on one side. Who is that? That's right, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so let me grab this helmet. I gotta go off camera here for a second and grab this one. Uh, and you can see, this would have been a helmet worn in the 50s, 60s. Uh, went to the harder plastic. You could drill the face mask on, web suspension system. It was used in military helmets for, for a number of years. Face mask bolted on. A lot of things now, it was a lot more secure, this helmet. Uh, so a lot safer. So we're coming a long way from, from the nose guard originally to, 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 to what we see here today. And then if we fast forward to the early 2000s, we see the Revolution helmet by Rydell. Uh, and you see there are some neat innovations, these aerosols on the inside. You can see an insert there for a needle on the top and on the back where you could pump these aerosols up to give it a more custom fit. And then you see here today, you see uh, the uh, Speedflex, which is the Revolution 2.0, and you see what this helmet looks like. And so a lot of neat innovations on this. Uh, insertion points for that face mask can pop off real quickly if they need to get a helmet off without, uh, you know, jerking the head around or things like that. Uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, cushion on the front so that way as head-to-head as -head collisions happen, there's a little bit more absorption of that. On the inside, there's a liner on the inside and these uh, cheek pads. Uh, there's pumps on the side that these things can be pumped up. Liners can be replaced. Cheek pads can be replaced. They can also be pumped up. So really today's helmet can really give a custom fit. And so what happens today is that it's really important as part of the uh, training that the uh, high school coaches undergo through uh, USA football, uh, and that's really the proper fitting of these helmets. Make sure they rest uh, on the proper place on the head. Make sure they're touching the cheekbone. Maybe it's directly on the head. Uh, you know, it should be tight enough to where when it pushes down, it should scrunch your head. It should be about one inch above your eyebrows. Uh, things like that, making sure you have a proper fit. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that the padding in there is correct and so making adjustments on that so it's very important that helmets are adjusted that way for today's safety and so and now today there's even helmets like vices uh, that use kind of car crash technology where it kind of absorbs and springs back that a vices helmet they're too they're really expensive uh, but if I drop this helmet if it was a vices helmet it would bounce right back up to me uh, so it's got that spring so it just kind of um, absorbs it and springs the force back out uh, in, in that and so uh, so as you guys can see over the past 100 plus years, uh, 130 years, we've gone from this to this, which is pretty amazing, you know? And these are the different kinds of stories we, we, tell, we talk about. Uh, stories about all kinds of different things. Let me tell you another story. Uh, look at this. What's this look like? It doesn't look like a football today. What's it look like? What other sport? You're exactly right, rugby. And football started from soccer and rugby. Uh, rules started being put in place in the 1870s, not the 1970s, the 1870s. It started differentiating it from, from rugby, where rugby, you just have people that kind of lined up and pass the ball side by side. You started putting people on the line. The ball was being snapped, being handed off. So rules have started putting it in place and separating it from, from the game, game of rugby. But you'll notice that this football is not very aerodynamic. And so as the forward pass became more and more prevalent in the NFL, that football got more and more aerodynamic. And so we can see, and I'll take my gloves off because this isn't a, uh, an actual authentic football from any particular record, but you can see that the football is easier to grip. If I gave this football to Peyton Manning or Drew Brees or Tom Brady or, or Patrick Mahomes, they might be able to throw it pretty well because they got big hands, but not nearly as accurate as this because this football is designed aerodynamically. When you throw it, rolls off the fingers, cuts through the air, reduces drag, friction, those things. And that's why a guy like, Tom Brady or Drew Brees can throw a 40-yard pass just spot on is because of the aerodynamics of the football. So as the forward pass became, became first of all, introduced in the NFL in the early 1900s uh, because of one of the reasons Teddy Roosevelt uh, was going to ban football, uh, not because he didn't like it, but because it was dangerous back in the early 1900s. Uh, and there was a year where there were deaths in pro football. And in 1906, the forward pass was actually introduced as a way to uh, instead of just lining up and forming a uh, kind of a, uh, a V, if you will, uh, and just 
you know, colliding into each other, the four paths started getting introduced to the game. And so there was a lot of rules and stipulations at that time, but as the game evolved, uh, the four paths started to open up more and more uh, and became more and more. But the four paths originally was introduced because it was trying to reduce on injuries. And, and Teddy Roosevelt called uh, leaders back in the early 1900s uh, as president and said, you know, this game's got to either change or it needs to be getting rid of. Uh, and he was a big supporter of the, even though he didn't play football, uh, he actually was a big supporter because he thought it taught people how to be, how to be tough, how to be manly, things like that. So he thought it was a great sport uh, to teach those kind of things, like uh, dedication, de determination, those kind of things. But said it had to change. So when they get in this meeting, that's when they started the forward pass and that evolved over the years. And so as the forward pass became more and more prevalent, now it's, some would argue that it's more of a pass friendly uh, NFL than it is a, a run friendly NFL uh, as compared to earlier years. And so um, that's the, uh, and we love it. We love to see the forward pass. We love to see the quarterback that airs it out 40 yards, 50 yards, 60 yards even, uh, right to the wide receiver and they run for a touchdown. So the pass is, is a very exciting part of the game today, but it has evolved and the football has evolved as that four pass has become more and more uh, prominent. And so uh, there's all kinds of things we could talk about with you guys. Uh, I could do another one is, 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 is obviously uh, something else that's, that's prominent that's on display at the Hall of Fame is the bronze bust. Now, uh, one thing you'll notice is that this is Sid Luckman, first of all. You guys would have no clue who Sid Luckman is, but he's a uh, quarterback from the Bears, 40s, 50s, uh, the, the, those eras. Er, eras. Uh, but this bronze bust is something that you would see if you came into the earlier bust. You see some of them are getting a little bit worn looking. Um, uh, sometimes they get kind of a green hue. You know, that's just metal that oxidizes, has to be refinished, and things like that. But you notice that the nose is kind of wear out, seem to wear out quicker. And so when we talk about the oils on our fingers, you'll notice some of the busts from like 1963, our original year, our charter class, uh, and, 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 and some of the early years, you'll see kind of the nose seems to wear out a little bit faster. And that's because even though people aren't supposed to touch, what we all know the golden rule if you go into a museum, don't touch, right? Well, people still want to touch the bus. And for some reason, for some reason, the first thing they want to touch when they come in. So, you know, think about it as the Steeler fans. Like, I've always wanted to see the bronze bust of mean Joe Green. And they come in here and they finally get face to face with Joe Green and they go like this. Which is kind of funny. So that's the first thing that they, they tend to touch is, is, is the nose. And so, uh, and so these are the bronze busts. They're actually 326 bronze busts on display. There are 346 members of the Pro Football Fame. We just announced 20 as part of our centennial class this year, uh, as part of our induction ceremony. So it could take place in August and September. Uh, but there are only 326 of these busts on display. They don't reveal them. They don't get those. They don't technically get enshrined into the Pro Football Fame, even though they've already been elected until the ceremonies that take place uh, in August when we kick off the NFL season with the enshrinement and the game and the concert and all those kind of things. And so this is the bronze bust that actually goes on display. And so with that, that being said, as you guys can see, there's all kinds of different stories we can share here. Uh, stories about footballs, stories about helmets, stories about bronze busts, stories about great football players, monumental moments, uh, stories about, you know, the football and the military, stories about card collections, you know, that we have here. I mean, just so many different stories that we can share with you guys. And we, we try to arrange these stories in particular. Uh, pick out the particular stories and the artifacts that we think help tell the history of best here. And that's our job here at the Pro Football of Fame is to, again, preserve the history of the game uh, and educate about the history of the game. And that word preserve is a very difficult word because it means to keep things intact. So this football, it, 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 the color that it's in right now, we want it to be the same color 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 150 years from now, who knows, 500 years from now that this football would be in the same condition as it is today. And so that's our job here. So with that being said, uh, that's a little bit about one of our other programs called the Story Pro Football. If any of you have any questions, comments, want to connect in for, for a video conference, want to come visit us for a field trip, please email us at education at profootballhof.com. Take care, everyone, and God bless.